we will go ahead and get okay. started now. So mm -hmm. let us um, right. let us go ahead and get started with the second uh, part of the program. So those of you who are joining us just for this second part, we welcome you to the third day of the May Institute. We are very excited to have an opportunity for us to uh, come together and discuss topics in mass spectrometry and proteomics and computation and quantitative studies. And still, you know, be productive and have fun uh, despite all the circumstances. So I hope that you will find this two, the program in these two weeks uh, useful. So if you are joining us for the first time in terms of logistics, just so you know that at the bottom of your screen, you have two uh, boxes. There is a chat box and a and a box. So the chat box is best to contact the panelists for some logistical issues if you're missing a URL or you need some particular kind of logistics question. Uh, but if you have questions to uh, the presenter regarding the technical uh, topics, so please use the Q&A box and it allows us to organize uh, the questions. And so we will interrupt the speaker as possible and voice your questions as much as uh, it's possible. And if we have more questions than what we can actually ask, we will carry them over uh, to the Google Doc. So we have a Google Doc, uh, which has links to the slides and also additional questions. And then if the speaker has a chance to answer, um, they will answer that. So this is uh, how it will works, how it will work. And so now uh, let me introduce our second uh, <coughs> keynote speaker of the day, uh, Professor Rudy Ebersold. It is my particular pleasure to welcome Rudy back to the May Institute. Rudy has been a participant with us uh, for a number of years and we had together uh, co-organized and co-led multiple short courses and multiple events like that. So it is a very special honor for me to introduce uh, Rudy, although I'm sure you know that Rudy doesn't need uh, much introduction. Uh, so Rudy holds a PhD in biology from University of uh, Basel. And then he was a, a postdoctoral post fellow in Caltech. He had faculty appointments in University of British Columbia and University of Washington. In 2000, he co-founded together with uh, Lee Hood and Alan Anderen Institute for Systems Biology uh, in Seattle, which was a pioneer in developing interdisciplinary approaches to uh, biological investigation. And then in 2005, Rudy went back to Switzerland uh, to become a, a founded, uh, founding director of the Institute for Molecular Systems Biology in ETH Zurich. And Rudy made numerous contributions to our field, and this includes approaches such as uh, ICAT to, um, to labeling quantitative mass spectrometry, uh, Rudy's lab made important contributions on the computational side, such as transproteomics pipeline and databases such as Peptide Atlas. Uh, Rudy made really important contributions to targeted proteomics um, and SRM, and also more recently to data independent acquisition and SWAS. And what I personally find particularly fascinating in Rudy's work is on one hand, the connection between the technology and the biological applications and how we, the technologies that are developed in his lab, I really really makes sure to show their practical utility for biological studies. And then the second thing, which I also find particularly amazing for this work is his mentoring and the, his way of interacting with junior scientists and how many people from his lab went on to become uh, very influential independent investigators. So this is, this is really my honor to uh, welcome Rudy uh, back. And we very much uh, look forward to your talk, Rudy. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Olga. It's uh, fun to be here uh, in my office and give this talk and hopefully we'll have some discussion. It would be, of course, much nicer to be in person in one site that one also will have personal interaction, but. It is not uh, possible right now, and I would like to uh, acknowledge and also congratulate Olga and her team, Mina, Ting, and Kylie, and the whole team that they managed to put together this May Institute in this entirely new format. Uh, 
uh, I think it is working quite well. And the benefit is that instead of the, so the number of people that can be reached is of course larger, but of course the interaction is much less personal. So I hope we will, we will still have a good exchange here um, in this format. And now I would like to start. So um, Olga created a title, Modern Technology for, for Modern Biology. It's a good title. I changed slightly the focus. I mean, it's not the, it's not the focus, it's the same focus, but what I would like to focus on in this uh, hour or so is how we can use the data that we create by these now pretty amazing proteomic techniques to learn new biology. Because ultimately, it is great to have in mass spectrometers. They are very uh, powerful. They produce beautiful data today. And, but ultimately, I think it is about what, do this, what does this data mean and what can we learn uh, about biological processes that uh, we, we do not know yet. Uh, that, um, so this is basically my topic. So let me start out by saying that biology and also medicine is essentially about function and phenotype. So we see here on the right-hand side um, two individuals of the same species, and everyone will immediately, will immediately see that they differ in one phenotype, of course, also in others, but one is size. So we, everyone can observe that. And of course, for a long time, one did not understand why, why is this, that some, some people in the same species uh, are so different from each other. And in medicine, of course, the same questions arise. You say that a person uh, may be afflicted with a particular disease, another person not. And so we would, uh, we would like to know what is the underlying uh, difference between the molecular difference between these phenotypes altered, like disease associated normal, so that medicine could eventually undertake something to reset this disease phenotype. So we have been conditioned through in the age of molecular biology over the last few decades that um, we use molecule, molecules as surrogates for function or phenotype. So we, we believe, I think this is a, one of the bedrock uh, assumptions in, in molecular biology, that it is the molecular constellation of a cell or an organism that determines its phenotype. Of course, we don't know the rules at least not precisely how specific molecules affect a phenotype. There is very um, clear indications of, for instance, in Mendelian, Mendelian genetics, where the link between the, the molecular landscape of the genome and the phenotype is quite clear, but usually it is much more complicated. And so as proteomics researchers who operate in this field of molecular biology, we would assume, and I think this is one of our uh, convictions, that be that the, the, the better or the best may be um, surrogates for function is proteins. And why is this? Because proteins, of course, carry out most of the biological functions. They catalyze them and also control biological function to a large extent. So this has led to the notion that if we would understand and measure, could measure and understand the function of essentially all proteins that are in our system, that is usually a cell, or it could be also a multicellular organism or an organ, then we would, we would make a lot of headway with understanding the biological processes. This is a, an assumption, and I think this is the guiding uh, assumption that uh, we, many, of, uh, many biologists and proteomics researchers pursue. So here is just to a few numbers to illustrate how complex the system is that we nicely can draw as a cell and we can give it a nucleus, uh, is, is indicate a nucleus and some other structures. But in, in the reality, this is an exceedingly complicated and actually amazing um, uh, uh, structure that we are studying here. So it is a highly complex multiplexed chemical reactor. At any given time, hundreds, if not thousands of biochemical reactions are concurrently occurring. Uh, the size is very small. We can, we can see them in a light microscope, of course, these cells, and the volume is approximately 1,000 femtoliters. 
size is a micrometer. So with the, with the naked eye, we don't really see the cell. There's exceptions like uh, oocytes, particularly frog oocytes, but generally these cells are, are in micrometer range. They contain about 8 uh, billion molecules, protein molecules. Of course, not all are different. There is a, there's, there's groups of proteins which are from the same gene, which are inherently quite homogeneous. But the number of molecules is very large, roughly the same as number of people on Earth. And the protein concentration in one of these cells is approximately 300 milligram per milliliter. So this is about maybe two orders of magnitude more concentrated than what we usually do when we do biochemical experiments in vitro by, in, in let's say, a, in a vitro kinase assay, where we usually operate in the one to few milligram per milliliter. So the conclusions here is we are dealing with a very complex system and that consists of a very large number of molecules and they are organized in a soup or in an environment that we really cannot achieve in or recapitulate by in vitro biology, by, by chemistry. So if we want to analyze these proteins based on the, what I just said, then we can see uh, what the challenge is, and I would like to make a few comments on how amazingly fast this protein proteomics field has developed. So I go back a few decades. This was the age of uh, where, pro where really protein identification by their sequence became feasible. So this was roughly in the 80s. That's when I did my PhD thesis. And at the time, this is what I actually was doing then, is to sequence proteins. And these proteins were um, proteins that had, had to be highly purified. And the, the, the type of proteins I worked with were relatively short polypeptide chains, particularly um, amino acid sequences of um, immune globulins, uh, where the light chains have approximately 150 amino acids. And to sequence one of those with a tedious stepwise de degradation of one amino acid at a time took me about six months of work. So this translated in about, at the time, in approximately one amino acid sequence, finished sequence per day. And to do that, I needed about 10 milligrams of pure protein. So most of the work actually went into purifying this, uh, this amount of protein. And uh, this is, of course, those who work in protein biochemistry know that to, see, to purify out of a biological sample, milligram amounts of pure protein is a is a sizable undertaking. So let's move forward a few decades to approximately now. We can claim, I think this would be not contested numbers, by, would not be contested by many, that we can identify uh, approximately 10,000 proteins per hour in a modern instrument. Uh, this translates in about one and a half million amino acids, amino acids sequenced per hour compared to one a day, some uh, decades ago, and the average amount of, the, of, of protein required from a very sequence of proteins of complex mixtures would be about 10, 250 femtograms. So this is an em, enormous progress. And in genomics, the, uh, there's a famous picture from the uh, National Institute of Health you know, of Genomic Sciences, and it shows that the progress in genomic sequencing in terms of sample throughput and price has been roughly following Moore's law, actually exceeded Moore's law. So it's faster than what Gordon Moore predicted for the um, uh, duplication rate of, of, um, of, of micro chips, basically electronic devices. So here we see, that we, I made some assumptions here and the student in the lab, Amir Banai, made, made this plot. And based on the results that I just showed in the previous slide and some number of of milestones in the in the development of mass spectrometric methods out of the uh, protein chemistry methods that were used some decades ago, we can conclude that in terms of the pro required protein amount to sequence a protein, the progress has been faster than Moore's law. And also in terms of throughput of proteins measured, for instance, by proteins or amino acids identified per, per time unit, we also see that it is faster that exceeds uh, Moore's law, which I think is, uh, is an indication how rapidly the field has developed.
So not only have we sequenced a lot of proteins, there's also a lot of resources that allow the field of proteomics to really um, do the analysis more reliable and, and really with generate data with high quality. So I want to just now in the following point out a few of these resources which are generally accessible and then, uh, and then move on with, with what I really would like to talk about. So one resource is the Human Peptide Atlas and it shows that it's, it's a um, part of the um, of a con consortium to, uh, to acquire and share the data that have been generated by these, by these mass spectrometric uh, studies in many laboratories. And this was started in 2004 by uh, visiting uh, scientists at the time, Frank Desier, together with Eric Deutsch and Alex Nesrisky at the Institute of Systems Biology in Seattle. So we, we thought we would collect data that people generate anyway, and once they publish a paper, we would ask them to donate the spectra. And then Eric Deutsch particularly developed a computational pipeline to conclude which peptides and proteins were represented by this massive amount of data consisting of, of hundreds or thousands of data sets. So this is roughly a, a state of today uh, for a few months ago, so hundreds of millions of peptide spectrum matches have been established from this very, very large number of spectra that have been uh, donated from thousands of experiments. There's about 1.8 million distinct peptides that have been identified. And there is for vast majority of the proteins in the human proteome. Uh, like for 82%, there is unique identify, identifier peptides for so canonical peptides, which identify the, pep, the protein uh, distinctively. And for about 14, there's evidence, but we, through the redundancy of peptides, we cannot really say whether a specific protein is in there or whether it's a member of a family. It's usually referred to as protein groups. So, for, so this means that the community of, of scientists uh, who have donated the data, uh, which is also, a, for instance, accessible. The same data is also accessible through, uh, through PRIDE in the, in the consortium called Protein, Prote, Protein Exchange Consortium. Consor consortium. Then this, this, data, this means that we basically are able to cover most of the proteins that are in, in the human species, but the same applies to many other species. So um, this is, of course, a lot of work to create this coverage. And it will be, and we also wanted to, at some point, see that through spectra would not only be accumulated to say we have this protein has been identified, but that we could use spectra in targeted experiments to then re-measure and, and confirm the presence of proteins in a hypothesis-driven way in samples. So Ulrike Kusebauch, uh, was the main driver of this project, which was done between our group and Rob Moritz's group at the ISB. And she undertook to synthesize a large number, about 150,000 peptides, uh, which were selected to represent most of the proteins of the human proteome and to generate spectra of these peptides uh, in different mass spectrometers under different fragmentation condi conditions. So we call this the human SRM atlas, and it's a resource for targeted assays to quantify uh, essentially any protein in the human protein. This effort now is continued and, and exceeded, in fact, and massively extended into phosphopeptides by Bernard Kuster, who just uh, was on this session before. And I think this is a great, uh, a great resource that uh, Ulrike created and now is being extended by the work of Bernard Kuster and his group. And I think these ref reference spectra are really a useful resource to do reliable re-measurements by a variety of targeting techniques like PRM, SRM, and also increasingly DIA SWOT measurements um, for the measurement through whole cohorts of samples. So uh, I don't wanna go into the uh, statistics here, but for most peptides, for most proteins, they have 18,000 proteins of the human proteome, five or more peptides are available that are in fact 
uh, that are uh, mapped into this specific proteins. There's only 22 proteins for which there is no uh, peptides available to identify these proteins in a sample by targeted mass spectrometry. So this is these are resources to say how was the protein covered, or what coverage has been achieved, and resources to to do measurement on any specific sample with the to test the hypothesis whether a protein is present and in in that sample and to quantify that protein. But we, as we will see later on, the greatest benefit of uh, of proteomics these days is probably not to say well we have identified a specific protein, but to, to identify a relatively large number of proteins, as many as possible, in as many replicates as possible. And so the, I, the idea of measuring proteins in, in sample cohorts with high reproducibility and, and, uh, and ac quantitative accuracy has been, of course, in the forefront of technology development, and our group has worked intensely to uh, bring along these uh, techniques that allows us to measure reproducibly, reproducibly proteins over hundreds of samples. And the solution that we uh, came up with is data-independent analysis initially implemented with the SWOS technique, which is probably further being discussed in this May Institute. And we now, uh, and I want to show just one slide to show that even these DIA techniques and the measurements are also really progressing very fast as a technique to acquire data across sample cohorts. So this is a, from a collaboration that we have we, we, we have undertaken with the group of Matthias Mann and the group of Hannes Röst in Toronto and, the, and, and also supported by Brucker, who developed an instrument which is called uh, um, a, a pa passive. So this is basically uh, an, an instrument that combines uh, a, a quadrupole TOF instrument with a uh, ion mobility device that stacks up ions to so that they, the ions can be accumulated before they're being analyzed. And so this allows us to measure basically to make better, much better use of the ion statistics to virtually well, should say virtually all, but most of the ions that are being created at the source are actually used to create fragment ion spectra. I don't have time here to get into this technique. There is an article in BioArchives that describes the instrument as well as the technique. I just want to show that this machine, in conjunction with this DIA, with the DIA technique, really provides quite, um, quite uh, fascinating data. So this is a uh, replicate analysis of, of, of a, a 200 nanograms of total lysate of HeLa. So this is a relatively small amount that is injected on a 100 min, minute gradient. And the system identifies quite reproducibly about 65,000 peptides corresponding to about 7,500 proteins. And I should say that these proteins are inferred from prototypic peptides only. There's no protein groups in there. And when we look what is detected in a single shot from this analysis, it is the blue part of the curve here, uh, and it, it's the proportion of the white curve, uh, which is the library that is which was generated by 24 reverse phase fractions of, of uh, uh, reverse, uh, separated fractions, and by the EDA analysis of the same instrument. So, we, um, then there is the reproduci reproducibility. So most peptides are covered in the repeats, except some where the signal to noise becomes very unfavorable. And there, of course, some peptides are only detected in a subset of the repli repli replicates. So this is just to show that um, the technique of acquiring data from large cohorts to generate uh, data sets, which are of quite deep, into the proteome and are quite quickly generated has also been progressing. And I think this roughly represents now the state of the art and it's also a data point from this Moore's law calculation that I showed before. It's one of the last uh, data points. So 
we, we would conclude here that for many uh, biological explorations where we would like to learn new biology, we would need to have a first data set. And we used to think about identifying as many proteins as possible from a sample. I think this is still valuable for some applications, but for, for many more applications, it is more valuable to have a data matrix where we have N samples and P proteins. And this data matrix can then be used for, for um, clustering, for correlation uh, type of analysis. And I will then expand in the, in the next minutes on how we use data created by this type of, of analysis, this, of this da data matrix type, to learn new biological um, insights in a number of different scenarios. So I just a couple of comments on this matrix and its shape and dimensions. So we learned, this is actually from a collaboration we have with Olga Vitek and especially with a postdoc in her group, a student in her group, Ting, that we, she, she, Ting simulated that if we have the choice to make this matrix broader, that has, that means have larger numbers of samples, then we generally create more useful information than if we, if we go deeper into the protein. Of course, we would like to do both. We would like to go broad and we would like to go deep. But there's always a trade-off with resources. And if we would have the choice to allocate certain amount of resources either into a large number of replicates, large number of samples, or to use the same resource to dig deeper in the proteome, into the proteome of fewer samples, the simulations uh, that clearly show that it is a benefit to go for more samples, potentially at the cost of a large number of proteins. But of course, we would like to de go deep as well. And this, this, this uh, DIA technique that I just showed allows us to go quite deep, quite fast, and also to go through a large number of samples. So all the subsequent analysis that I'm going to show we will now discuss how we can extract biological information that are always dependent on data matrices of some sort where we have a certain number of samples that are measured in a, in a certain number of proteins. And from this data matrix, as opposed to a list of proteins, we try to conclude new biological insights. So to summarize this first part, what I would like to try to, to illustrate just as a setting the scene for the subsequent part, um, we would we try to justify why proteomic researchers focus on proteins as their subject matter of study. Uh, that is because proteins, we think, are very close to biological function because they catalyze and control most functions. Proteomics is justified by the focus, therefore, on the function modules or mod molecules of the cells. I try to show that proteomics has made enormous progress over the last few years. There is now solid evidence for most proteins in the human species and in other species. There's reliable spectral assays for virtually the whole predicted human proteome that can be used in, for hypothesis testing using targeted analysis. Um, reproducible deep and quite accurate measurements of proteins in single shot DIA methods is certainly possible. And, uh, and Bernard talked about TMT, which has, of course, measurements which has very similar objectives. And the, these techniques allow us to generate extended data matrices of, of actually quite good quality. So we will conclude here so far that we can measure proteins amazingly well, but, but, but how can we translate these large-scale molecular data into functional biological knowledge? So this is now the, uh, the, the, the points I would like to discuss in the following. So as a guide through these next few kind of vignettes, I use a graph that was generated by Isabel Bludau, who was a student in our group till a few months ago. And she wrote at the end of her thesis a review where she discussed the complications of the proteome and the challenge it, it poses. So we have now said so far in this uh, presentation that we focus on the proteome 
And when we and most proteomic studies are focused on an instance of the proteome, that basically consists of, of any one of a number of transcripts of pro pro translation products of transcripts from any one of the genes. So we know, of course, we have roughly uh, 20,000 gene protein coding genes in the human proteome. And these are translated. And when we identify proteins, we would typically say we have identified a protein from this gene, but we do not make a specification typically which form of that protein we have identified. And we know, of course, that there's a massive expansion of the number of, 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 of molecules, which we believe are functional molecules, that are generated from these 20,000 or so protein coding genes as we go along the axis of gene expression. So this graph shows that we see that, of course, these, these genes are transcribed at first, and then at the level of transcription, there is a diversification, for instance, through alternative splicing. There is then the further amplification of the number of potential products that these alternatively spliced transcripts can be translated and in different forms, for instance, through alternative start sites. And then, of course, there's enormous diversification at the level of post-translation modifications. And then there's a further enormous combinatorial um, uh, space where proteins, or more specifically proteoforms, derived from this amplification or expansion mechanisms can, to some extent, combinatorially form protein complexes. And at the end here, we have the phenotypes. And what we would like to, to know, of course, which functional units, which proteoforms, which protein modules, or combinations thereof, are actually functionally and causally causing a particular molecular function and potentially phenotype. So this poses enormous challenges. And because we can measure these things quite well, we can measure thousands of PTMs, for instance, phosphocytes or UB sites, ubiquitination sites. We can measure different proteoforms. We can measure number of protein complexes, but we don't necessarily know what they functionally mean for the cell and the determination of phenotypes. So this is the topic I would like to discuss, approaches where we can make the basically determine based on proteomic data, the functional significance of the proteome. And I will do this at four different stages here as we go along the axis of gene expression. We will talk about the pro functional insights into translation products of a particular gene. This is what most people measure. We'll then go to some um, uh, PT, functionalization of PTMs, functionalization of um, complexes, and then functionalization of proteoforms in the context of specific complexes, namely how proteoforms associated with complexes. So we'll see how far we get because this is quite a lot of material and we'll want to be cognizant of the time, but this was what I thought we would do. So let's go to the first question. And the first level, what is the functional significance of the proteome at the level that most proteomic laboratories operate, including ours, where we say we have identified with a mass spectrometer specific proteins. We may not be able to extinct, exactly distinguish the proteoforms, which, but we, we, we define proteins basically as translation products of a specific gene without usually differentiating between uh, the specific products that, for instance, could be generated by alternative splicing or by PTMs. So um, we can, of course, do direct biochemical analysis of the proteins. And this can be done and has been done very successfully by in vitro reactions. So an example here is an ex a direct experimental determination of a biochemical function of a protein in the case of a protein kinase. So we would have, uh, this is just an example, there's many other examples one could use, but we would have a protein that is a 
uh, a substrate of a particular protein kinase. One might use a panel of proteins if one does not know the substrate specificity of this kinase and would simply incubate this target protein with, for instance, radioactive ATP in the presence of a particular kinase for which we want to test the activity. And then we would, we would observe that this protein target, this target protein or substrate is converted into a phosphorylated protein by the presence and the activity of this protein kinase. So this is a very classical biochemical experiment. And this would immediately prove that this enzyme that we're studying here has the ability to transfer a phosphate ester group onto a protein. And we would then conclude that this particular protein has a biochemical activity that is, uh, that is a pro that of a protein kinase. So this has been done, of course, by, for many, many proteins. And, but it is a, something that is really not generally tractable for all the factors of the proteome or the components of the proteome. Because we need to know what is the assay. We need to know what is the substrate. We need to know what is the anticipated reaction. Then we need to, we need to then uh, carry out, uh, basically establish an assay. And we would, of course, then need to purify this the protein that's to be tested. So to do that for a protein where there is nothing known, so a protein that might come out of a particular screen and we know nothing about this protein, to actually determine the biochemical function is a huge amount of work and generally not tractable on a proteome by its scale. So this is a, um, this is a, a problem because we are now, um, it's a fundamental problem because we are now able so really, we are able, we are extremely capable of measuring large numbers of proteins. And many of those proteins show interesting behavior in a certain experiment. And but we don't know necessarily what is the function of these proteins, nor do we know how can we determine this function biochemically in, in analogy to this kind of kinase assay that I just showed. So many of the, of the Proteomic analysis where conditions are being combined uh, or compared are usually represented in a plot, which many of us, of course, probably everyone knows, which is this volcano plot. And we would, we would test different conditions, for instance, tumor cells and non-tumor cells or activated cells or non-activated cells. And we would measure the proteins in terms of which proteins change between these conditions, condition one and condition two. And this plot then simply says, we identified a large number of proteins. Each dot here is a protein. For the proteins that we have that are red colored, we are sure uh, with a certain probability that at a certain probability that we have correctly identified this protein and that between the conditions, it shows a different quantitative behavior. So the abundance has changed between condition one and condition two. This is a very frequent outcome of biological experiments where, where, where where scientists try to figure out what is the difference between the proteome of two, of two or more conditions. So we are able to do this, but then we would like to know, of course, what are these proteins doing? What are they telling us? What biochemical processes are different between condition one and condition two? So we need to make the link between the identity of a protein to its function. The way we do this, uh, is by look, usually by looking things up. So basically relating the, the proteins that are in this red part of the volcano plot and relate it to the known knowledge of, of the functionalized proteome. So it's actually remarkable how much is known about the proteome in a functional level, but many proteins, about 2,000, are still entirely uncharacterized. So this is about 10%. So we might say, well, this is not so bad because 10% is not a very large number. And one could say, well, eventually these 2,000, roughly 2,000 proteins, which are uncharacterized yet, eventually they will be characterized by and functionalized by, by some form of biochemical assay. So we make two assumptions that the, uh, and I should say this is work that is uh, compiled by the group of Amos Beroch, which, uh, which uh, maintains the, uh, the Swiss Prot and Uniprot databases, which are tremendous resources to look up what proteins might be doing uh, in terms of their function. 
So uh, we make two assumptions here, that the proteins for which something is known, that this information is correct and actually, um, and actually uh, useful to be used. And we would assume that eventually these other 2,000 proteins will also be uh, associated with specific functions. So now I want to test these assumptions a little bit with some system data from the literature. So let's first look to what extent the knowledge in the literature is spread out about the, uh, uh, about the, around the proteome. So we can, this is work uh, from, which is cited from this uh, article here. We can, we can analyze basically to what extent is the literature a even or representation of the, uh, of the knowledge spread out over the proteome, or to what extent is the literature biased on specific hotspots where the same proteins are always uh, cited again and then studied again. So basically, uh, uh, do we have a rich, the rich get richer uh, situation where the same proteins get studied and, and uh, published on this, uh, a lot of papers get published on these proteins because already so, a lot is known, and, or, or, or do we have a more even representation of the literature over a large number, ideally all the functions that the proteome can carry out. And so this is, this is um, what the data show. This is basically an analysis of the literature with respect to a uh, literature-centric analysis where we ask what fraction of the literature is um, covered by, by, the, by uh, specific proteins in, in, in terms of literature citations. So the red group here to be explicit, uh, the red colored protein, uh, the red colored proteins are proteins that have more than 500 papers that report about these proteins. And we can see that these proteins that cover where more than 500 uh, papers have been published on these proteins cover more than 75% of the total proteomic literature. If we add proteins which have 100 to 500 citations or basically papers published on them, then these are probably close to 90% of the papers published on proteins are, are, on, are covered with those proteins where a large number of, of reports have been published. These red and the green, however, when we go to a protein-centric representation of the literature, only cover about 25% of the proteome. So we can clearly see that there's a huge overrepresentation of relatively few proteins in the literature. And there is a large fraction of, of, of proteins, namely all these here, which the, the blue, uh, the, the ochre, the gray, where there's less than 10, less than 20 papers for about 40% of proteins is less than less than 20 papers have been published about these proteins. So there's a huge bias in the literature today about the proteome. And so we could say, well, this is not too bad. We can simply uh, expect that this will ev eventually even out. But it is currently a, a big problem because when we look up pay, uh, proteins from these volcano plots that show up as with interesting behavior, then we are typically are forced to go and look for proteins where a lot is known already, so the green and the red, and then we write something about these proteins in our paper and basically propagate, uh, contribute to, to this bias. So um, this bias has been clearly noticed. This is an interesting report from the group of uh, Stöger in, in 2018, where they said, can we take the protein literature um, and can we find features that is, are associated with these proteins which would determine whether a protein is showing up in a publication. So this is basically the same uh, question that one might ask in a biomarker study where one has a number of proteins and would ask do these proteins uh, allow us to classify 
patients. So here we would not apply, like to classify patients. We'd like to have features on these proteins that would classify basically the, the publications, whether these, whether these proteins are, 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 are showing up in publications. And so what they came up with is the relatively small number of features of, of genes or proteins predict the number of publications. So that means basically, and these are very well, very well known, uh, studied uh, by chemical processes or cell biological processes, which have been extensively studied and, and dozens or hundreds of papers have been published. So this, I don't need to go through these names, but everyone who, who studies uh, biological processes will know that these are uh, parts of the biochem cell biology which have been extensively studied, uh, for instance, membrane proteins uh, and specific biochemical functions. So they went even further. They even said, can we basically develop a classifier from the studying the proteins that are frequently appearing in the literature and make it through peer review that would allow us to predict where if you write a grant proposal, which type of proteins we should write the grant proposal apart so that the grant proposal has a high likelihood of being funded. So they basically predict from the entirety of these proteins where they try to extract features which predict that if we study these, these features, these proteins with that, which have these features in a, in a grant proposal, that we would have a better than random chance to actually get a grant funded. So this is the um, is a correlation with the predicted numbers and the actual uh, dollars that would expend it on that the, the model predicts to, that dollars would be expended on on this based on these features and that's the actual data that from uh, NIH funding and there's there's uh, not a great but a fairly substantial correlation. So what they what this basically all means that the num that the publications that are, are making it through peer review and scientists publish are repeat, repeatedly focusing and on similar features and these, pro, and these similar features are covered by specific sets of proteins. So um, now we could say, well, this is probably temporary because as the research goes on, we will eventually have all the proteins functionalized and this would mean then that these uh, biases will eventually disappear. So here, uh, this is again from, a, from uh, this paper from Sinha, they studied over time whether there were new proteins entering the literature. So new, fun new functions that are carried out by proteins that would, entering, that would enter into the literature. We have several curves here, and these curves are, are proteins um, that have a, a certain number of papers that report on them. So this one here is 500 or more papers. This, the green, is 100 or more papers. And the curves up here, these kind of the, the two on top, are papers where there's virtually nothing known. So this zero or one paper that appears in the literature. So these are the newcomers. These are papers that report on proteins which previously have not been described. So this is encouraging. Because in the, in the, from the 60s to 2000, and I come back to the, to the reason why I made this bar here in 2000, is that in, the, in this biochemical age, there was every year a, a, a number, actually an increasing number of proteins entered the literature with this description about the function uh, that were previously not known. So there's an increase in the expansion of, uh, of the coverage of the proteome in terms of function assigned to proteins. So it was kind of a, the hope that the bias would diminish. But now we entered in 2000, basically the omics age, and we see a trend, a, a distinctive trend, uh, change in trend. The number of proteins that we are reported newly in papers. So these are proteins for which nothing was known. And now someone went through the trouble of uh, assigning a function to, for instance, the biochemical characterization of this protein and entering this in the literature has drastically decreased. So whereas the number of proteins for which 500 or 100 uh, papers already have been published has increased, 
So the, the trend in the, towards the bias, increasing the bias, the, uh, the trend of the bias has been increasing as, it, as opposed to decreasing since the emergence of omics, the omics world. I think this is, this is my personal view. This is a subjective, not objective, is that the reason of that is techniques like clustering, volcano plot, association studies, basically data-driven approaches, where we generate a, a large volume of really high quality data in proteomics, but also of course in genomics and metabolomics. We then have the challenge to identify what these proteins or genes mean, and, to re and what we do is we go and look up what's already known and report on these proteins. It is much easier to, to write a paper on a protein like P53, where there is thousands of reports, and say we found a new aspect of P53, uh, then to say a pro then to take then to take a protein like this here where nothing is known yet, and and say we 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 found this protein to react under certain conditions in its abundance, for instance, by when we stimulate a cell with a certain factor. Then reviewers will say, well, we have to go and learn much more about this protein. If we say it is P53 has a role in a new process, it's as established by an association or by a volcano plot, then no reviewer will question that this is an, that this is an, that this is an important protein. So this is, fair, to me, this is fairly interesting. And I think it points towards an urgent need in the field of cell biology and biochemistry to reverse this trend and to find ways to enter new insights on a large, uh, to, to report new functional insights on a larger number of proteins, which have not really been functionally studied so well. Maybe there's very little known or nothing at all. This is also, of course, a great opportunity for uh, proteomic researchers to undertake that, but it is difficult work and, um, and it's not so clear how one would do that. So I want to summarize here this part. What I wanted to discuss is the determination of biochemical function of proteins that are identified in screens. For instance, in, in volcano plot screens, association studies, or in cluster, in, in analysis like clustering. So what, what I try to show is the experimental and functional analysis of proteins is not compatible with, on a proteomic scale. So we cannot just go and take 20 newly identified proteins that show interesting behavior in a association study like a GWAS study or PWAS study or in a, or, or a, or a QTL analysis or in a volcano plot and go and say, we want to study what these proteins are doing. This is too ex expensive, too slow, and too much work, and virtually no one is doing it. So then we focus the functional investigated on this, of discovered proteins. is mostly by literature reference, and we show, and I try to argue that the literature is blind to the function of thousands of proteins, and is highly biased towards relatively few proteins of, from which there's already a lot been studied and by reporting on these proteins new facts, we, we conclude we contribute to this bias. So fun, and we even show, I even show through this um, interesting paper by the Stöger group that funding is focused, uh, funding by, for instance, the NIH, is funded, is focused on well-studied proteins, the rich get richer, and conversely, if you want, to fu want funding from the NIH, you might as well study what is already known which is a very depressing conclusion, of course, but it's actually supported by the facts, uh, by the data from this analysis. Okay, so now- Would Just one I question maybe from yes? a participant. So in 1975, there was a spike uh, where a large, so large increase in publications of new protein coding genes, and then the spike went down. So can we comment on that? I think it's on the graph on the previous slides. Yeah. Yes. So, so this was around, um, around time here, around 80. Uh, I don't know for sure, but it could be that was rough. I mean, you can see what happened there technologically. And this was, of course, roughly the time uh, when gene cloning became, uh, became feasible. And so, many, so probably, I mean, it's, I don't know, they would have to look into this more, but it's possible that people started to 
clone genes with pre previously unknown function express these genes in and to and to, to so that one could then uh, generate protein that which could be tested of course because of course when you want to undertake some kind of biochemical assay one of the limitations is that the protein has to be available and through these gene cloning techniques and gene expression techniques where one could generate now uh, amounts of proteins that are compatible with biochemical assays in large amounts and and also if it's with eventually with affinity tags then this made of course many proteins much uh, easier accessible to functional tests. So I, that would be my first guess, but I don't know whether this is actually uh, the main cause. Okay, so, um, so now I would like to go uh, a step further. So, so far I basically just illustrated the problem and illustrated also how difficult it is to assign a function a, new, a function to a newly discovered protein or, or a protein for which nothing is known to assign a function to it. The same is of course true for PTMs. And this is <coughs> probably even a more pronounced problem with PTMs because uh, there the discrepancy of what can be measured, what's known already functionally is even larger. So currently, um, there's more than 100,000 human phosphocytes alone have been described. And, uh, and probably the estimates are that, that roughly 10% of them have some form of functional annotation. So there's a tremendous need to try to figure out what are these modifications doing or how do they change a protein or the protein's function if they um, are present or if they're absent. So this is the topic I would like to discuss in the next few minutes. So we know uh, that in proteomics or in protein chemistry, the same happens like in this transformer. There's two, uh, this, there's two instances of pieces that are put together in some way. The pieces are exactly the same, but they are put together in different ways. So they can have different functional, uh, also functional appearances. This one looks like a car would drive around. This is a kind of a monster robot that would have completely different functions in the part. So the same parts can be organized differently, leading to different function. And we also know that this conversion between one function and the other can oftentimes happen in by by changing uh, the modifications, so basically by driving the shape from one shape uh, to, to, to another by a modification. So now, uh, translate this into the biochemical world. This is a graph, so this is work that was carried out by Tina Ludwig uh, a while back when she was a postdoc in our group with Anna Paula Olivares and Paola Picotti, and this is a collaboration between our group and US Hours group at ETH. The, the question was, can we identify modifications on enzymes that have a known function? And can we determine whether these modifications change the function of these enzymes? So this is the enzymes we studied. This is um, basically the yeast central uh, metabolism, which is basically energy metabolism. So they, we see here glycolysis, ECA cycle, and so very, very well known reactions. We initially, or this was, uh, this was Tina and Anna Paula and Paola Picotti, they initially identified the modifications they could detect by mass spectrometer on these proteins. So we see here that. These are the reactions. These are the, these are the enzymes that have, they have names that carry out a specific reaction in this metabolism. And they're color coded. When they're phosphorylated, they are red. When they are acetylated, they are blue. And when they are thiolated, they are green. And we would, of course, like to know what are these, what are these modifications that occasionally under certain conditions occur on these proteins 
doing to the activity of these proteins. So I wanted to ask specifically, does phosphorylation activate, inactivate, or not affect the catalytic activity of these enzymes in this, um, in this metabolic system? So the experimental setup was <coughs> that um, we grew cells, yeast cells, under various conditions, so five growth conditions, where the cells are put into different metabolic states, and three shift uh, experiments where they shifted from, from one state to the other. So the details are not really important, but when we think of this data matrix I showed before, this would be different conditions in which we measure the phosphorylation state of, of these proteins that are part of these metabolic systems. So we know the phosphor sequence. We would then generate SRM assays. Today, we would, one would do this with uh, probably with DIA measurements. But the principle was we put the cells in different conditions with the assumptions that the metabolics, that these enzymes would be in a different functional state. And we would observe this functional state by doing quantitative analysis of the phosphorylation sites that are known, that were identified to be present on these proteins under the specific conditions. And then we would correlate this phosphor data with other data, and the data we correlated with was metabolic flux. And metabolic flux basically means is the flux of substrate through that particular enzyme. Each one of these enzymes has an adduct and has, uh, converts an adduct into product, and this flux is measurable also by mass spectrometry and in, by the field of, of metabolomics. So we basically would generate different uh, data on, on each enzyme. We would determine the uh, abundance of the enzyme. We would determine the phosphorylation state of the enzyme. And then we would de determine the flux, the metabolic flux, through that enzyme under a variety of conditions. So this is a typical case where we generate this data matrix of, of conditions versus a quantitative entity, and in this case is the phosphorylation state, and we have correlated this then with the flux. So we would, we can then do the following. It's an enzyme, hexokinase, doesn't really matter, the name doesn't really matter, but it's an enzyme that carries out a specific function. It carries out glucose, it converts glucose into glucose 6-phosphate with the util utilization of ADP. So when, when this enzyme, uh, we can measure the, end, the phosphorylated enzyme, form of the enzyme by proteomics, we measure the flux through this enzyme metabolomics, so basically how often it does this in func as a function of its phosphorylation state. And if this correlation is positive, then so that means the more phosphor form is present, the, the higher the flux, we would say the phosphorylation activity the phosphorylation event activates the enzyme. When the, when the flux correlates positively with the non-phosphorylated form, we will conclude that the uh, phosphorylation actually inhibits the phosphorylation because the more non-phosphorylated proteins present, the higher the flux. So we, would, we can use this correlation of two data types. We integrate this data by uh, by correlation, and we basically say we can conclude whether a phosphorylation event that's observed in any one of these enzymes is activating, inactivating the enzyme, or is doing nothing to the activity of the enzyme. So this is what came out. These are names of, of enzymes in this pathway, in the central carbon metabolism, that are, um, that for which we found phosphorylation sites. And here we have a number of them which where phosphorylation activates the enzyme function. We have a number of them where the enzyme is inactivated by the uh, enzyme function. And so these are relatively few enzymes. And uh, there's in the whole study were a few more. So in fact, there were uh, 16, we found 16 phosphopeptides that were, uh, could be tested in this approach. So you might say, well, 16 is not really a proteome-wide study. And so this is, of course, true. But in, before this was done, this was not so long ago, this was like between 12 and 15, um, 
There's only one the whole literature of, of, the, of metabolism, which is one of the best studied uh, by chemical systems in, in, that we know. There's only one enzyme for which the phosphorylation has been described uh, to affect in a, at the enzyme activity. This was the enzyme PD, PD, PDA1. And so in this, sim in this simple study, uh, we, we could create data on um, seven, we could discover seven phosphocytes that activate enzymes, two that inactivate enzymes, and, sev and several, had, several others had no effect on the enzyme activity. So this, this is not large numbers, but it expanded the, the number of the, pre of the prior knowledge multiple times. And this, of course, was done, this was done by SRM by following relatively few phosphorylation events. We have now since repeated this analysis with a much larger number of phosphocytes monitored over a larger number of conditions uh, with, with DIA measurements. And these data have been acquired, but they're not really uh, um, analyzed yet fully. But it doesn't matter because I just wanted to show a principle that we can use uh, in use data-driven inference by, in, by relating the data obtained in systematically structured uh, assays to relate to some other activity, for instance, catalytic activity uh, that can be measured by, for instance, metabolic flux analysis to learn the, the functional significance of specific PTMs. I think this general approach is expandable to, extendable to many other biochemical systems. And, um, and, and I think this circumvents the need to establish a biochemical, definitive biochemical assay for every protein in, in tedious one-on-one uh, -on -one work. So the summary here will be um, the inference of functional states of identified proteoforms the abundance of a protein does not indicate the amount of its activity, as we know that, of course. And we would like to know uh, whether the activity is modulated by um, specific proteoforms, for instance, phosphoforms of a protein. Direct activity measurement is prohibitively expensive on a proteomic scale, it should be a scale. And activity state can be inferred by correlating suitably structured data sets. The example I chose here or presented is uh, protein phosphorylation, quantitative changes over a number of conditions correlated with, met with metabolic flux uh, changes uh, in, in under these conditions through specific enzymes. And so these, these are basically association studies and they depend on high quality protein versus abundance data matrices, and some other type of data, for instance, metabolic flux analysis. So um, um, how, 20 minutes, how are we doing roughly 20, roughly 20 minutes left. OK. So now I'd like to move to this arrow here. And, and, and and focus on the function of protein interactions uh, and specific protein complexes. This is, of course, an interesting field because we know uh, also from biochemistry that most biochemical functions are not carried out by a specific protein in isolation, but most frequently by complexes where multiple proteins associate with um, other proteins, or for that matter, RNA. And we also know that these uh, complexes are frequently modulated, for instance, by PTM, so for instance, by phosphorylation. Or, and so the, this, this argument, which was used a lot by the argument of guilt by association. So if you know some proteins, to, a protein of a complex to have a specific function, for instance, to be a protein kinase, and you can establish that the green protein associates with this protein kinase. You would assume that this green protein in the wider sense is involved in protein uh, phosphorylation as a broader biochemical activity. So this, this is the topic I'd like to now discuss. I'd like now to discuss in, in, a, with, in exam, exemplify with a study that a huge amount 
of very useful information can be learned from the from the protein complex level so the pro, how proteins are organized in the protein into modules i would like to show that these modules are to some extent a buffer of changes that are occurring here at the transcriptional and translational level in terms of, of abundance changes and i would like to show that we can detect um, changes in the proteome at the level of their associations, the modularity of the proteome that are, that are directly related to phenotypic changes that we can observe. So uh, let me first explain what we do here, uh, so, and then I show some results. To test the, uh, the idea that at the level of the proteome organization into modules, there is important and changes thereof, important biochemical information, function information can be learned, we need to first find a way to perturb cells so that they, may, they might change the, uh, the molecular landscape. This, of course, can be done by directed um, change through CRISPR, for instance, or, or any other genetic ma manipulation. We like to use um, naturally occurring variability because we know that this variability is not lethal because the cells have survived. But, and so that usually this naturally occurring variability is relatively mild and because it is not lethal, but it is also uh, certainly measurable and we can measure the propagation of, of, of for instance, genetic variability. So we, we chose here uh, to use cells which are inherently from the same source. Now, this is HeLa cells, which are very frequently used. And we, we chose these because we assumed that over time they had undergone genotic, genomic, genomic drift so that they have changed the genome and then we can measure how this genomic variance percolates along the axis of gene expression, along the axis of the central dogma. We generate multi-layer omics data sets from, these, from a panel of HeLa cells. And then we compute how the genomic variability affects the transcriptome, the proteome uh, composition, and the organization of proteins and the function, as expressed by some phenotypes. So this is a graphical abstract. We selected from different laboratories HeLa cells, which have been cultured in the laboratory for a certain time, assuming that they had undergone genomic shift. So these were uh, 14 cell lines that we collected. Some of the cell lines were collected only a few months apart, like uh, two, three months apart. From each one of these cell lines, if were were grown under the same conditions, we created genomic data by measuring the copy number variation, namely how the genome had, uh, had altered, not by single nucleotide changes, but by whole blocks of the genome that have been either duplicated or deleted. We measured RNA expression, steady state proteome, protein turnover, and we measured some, some phenotypes. So these data all exist, and it's just, it's just in a, um, ever collected uh, from all of these cell lines. And here is uh, also to show that these cells are certainly different, even though they have the same name. This is the doubling time from these 14 cell lines and this was ours, so we can see that the fastest growing, fastest dividing, under the same condition, same medium, same person, same laboratory, uh, would grow, uh, divide roughly twice as fast as the slowest one among these collected cells. So this is clearly a phenotypic difference, and then we measured another phenotype, and that's the ability of the cells to be invaded by Salmonella. So Salmonella are bacteria that infect uh, human cells and we and it and and uh, so one of the phenotypic measurements we could easily undertake is to say is to ask which one of these cells, if we fed them or exposed them to a certain uh, number of salmonella, how many of the salmonella would go into the cell? And so basically, the ability of the cell to be infected by the salmonella was is a is a quantitative phenotype that could be measured, and this just shows that these cells also differ substantially in this phenotype. Basically, this is the, this is the, uh, this is the size of this graph here is related to the ability of the cells to be infected by Salmonella. Uh, 
So they differ quite substantially. This one cannot be infected at all, and the others can be infected to some extent, but to different extent. So these are two phenotypes. This is proteomic data, and this is genomic data now to illustrate the uh, difference, the genomic difference at the level of copy number variation. So we see here each circle, this concentric circle, is one genome, of, is the genome of one of these cells. Um, Red means there's a high copy number. So there's multiple copies of this particular locus are present. Green means a low copy number, like one or two. And so we can clearly see that each one of the cells has a different copy number profile. So uh, some of these are, these are all relatively similar here, but then they, these are different in this chromosome. And so we can, everyone will see graphically that they're different. I'd like to point this to these two outermost cells, cells in 14. This, this area here and this area here are substantially different. And these cells were grown in the same laboratory and are harvested about three months apart. So within three months of culturing these cells in the laboratory, a substantial duplication or loss of duplication of, of this chromosome 15 and chromosome 8, a substantial part of it, was observed. So these are highly unstable cell lines which have implications for reproducibility of research results, which I don't want to discuss here. We simply use this here as a system to where natural variability has occurred through genomic instability mechanisms. And we want to ask how does this genomic variability affect the uh, organic the proteome and the organization of the proteome. So this is the, an overview of relative gene expression patterns in cell lines for two chromosomes at the level of copy number, genomic, transcriptomic, and proteomic. We can immediately see that very strong blocks here of increased, um, increased uh, presence, copy number presence of specific chromosomes or parts thereof is tendentially also apparent at the transcript and protein level, but not as distinctively. So even in this red zone here, we have green zones, which means there is proteins and transcripts and proteins in, in loci which are amplified that are not amplified. So there's, a, there's a not a strong correlation between the copy number, the gene dosage, the abundance of the transcript, and even less so for the abundance of proteins. So this is graphically shown here. This is shown here by actual <coughs> numerically by measuring the correlation between, for instance, copy number and mRNA, copy number variation and protein, um, protein abundance. We see always a broad distribution. We see a mean uh, correlation factor, which is, which is positive, but not strongly positive. So basically this means that uh, which probably everyone already knows, that there is not a predictable uh, 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 correlation and strong enough to allow us to predict the amount of protein from the amount of an RNA, and does not allow us to predict the amount of RNA from the amount of copy numbers in a, in a gene. So this is pretty well known. And now we wanted to see whether we could deduce some conclusions in the relation to the protein organization. Uh, so now we clarifying we... question on the previous yes. slide. What is a protein class, the bottom? Oh, mm -hmm. This is the um, degradation. K loss, this is, the, this is basically a representation of the half-life of the protein, which is, measure, which is measurable by, by, uh, by mass spectrometry by using isotopic labeling and then basically look how uh, measure how the uh, signal decays. So it's the it's a representation of the half life. I'm coming to this. I'm glad you asked that because I use this term now in the next slide. Thank you. So now we correlate. Um, so now this is a going a step further. Now we want to ask the question whether in the proteotype or proteom organization, namely the fact that proteins associate into complexes. Has any uh, is a determinant or can be whether the gene dosage that we see 
can be compensated by the organization of the proteome into protein complexes. So to explain that or to investigate that, we, we, we categorized the proteins that were measured into two groups. One is, one is a group which we call complex in. These are proteins which are known to be in complexes. And they know that because they are proteins which are known to be in a complex in a database called Quorum. This is the best um, curated database for protein complexes. And we have, so these are the complex in proteins. And this, this one, the, the greenish ones, the complex out proteins, these are proteins which are not known to be in a complex. They could be, but there's no evidence for it at this point. So we then can correlate the copy number variation for the complex in and the complex out proteins between copy number and mRNA. And we see that there is no difference between them. There's this distribution for uh, copy number to mRNA correlation, which I saw showed in the previous slide, but there's no difference in really that between the complex in and the complex out uh, transcripts. So that means the, the transcripts do not know, of course, whether the protein eventually will end up in a, in a protein complex. And so there's no signal that would indicate that the eventual organization of the projects in pro, uh, pro, those proteins into modules is not apparent at the level of the transcript. This is different when we correlate copy number with proteins. Here we see that there is a, is a clear difference between the, between the, the median here, uh, correlation, but basically the distribution of the correlation, the median uh, for the complex in and complex out proteins. And, and the opposite is true when we, well, it, the, the, they're also different, but in the opposite way is when we correlate the copy number with the K-loss the degradation rate of proteins. So basically what this, what the way these results can be explained, that if we go along the, the uh, axis of gene expression, we ex the, the cell expresses protein uh, transcripts, and these transcripts can be uh, in these groups that eventually we call complex and complex out groups, but at the level of the transcripts, this is indifferent uh, for, the, for the correlation between copy number and RNA between the two groups. When we go to the proteins, there's a clear difference and the proteins that are in are down, um, the correlation is, is lower and generally than for the complex out one. So they're down buffered in terms of their, of their strength of correlation. So what we, what we conclude here is this protein synthesized, which cannot be incorporated into a complex because the other members of the complex are not present. These proteins have no place to go and they are they're preferably destroyed. And we see this because they are, this, be, be, from this picture here, that they are, um, they are preferably degraded. So we will conclude here that the organization of the proteome into functional modules is a mechanism by which amplitude changes coming from genetics or other perturbations is, is buffered, and that this is a stabilizing factor from the point of view of, um, of, of functional perturbation, of moving functional per, moving molecular perturbation to functional perturbations. So this enticed us to try to start looking whether we could measure changes in the organization of the proteome systematically. Um, and we do this by a very old technique which, so we basically would like to have a cellular network. We would have a state one and state two. This could be one cell line from this HeLa, for instance, another cell line, or, or an inactive and an active cell line, or whatever the case may be. And we would like to now project these abundance changes that we see onto this interaction, a protein-protein interaction network. And we'd like to say, not only are these proteins changing abundance, but they're also changed in their association into specific function units. And because oftentimes the function, the function of a molecule in a complex is known, we would like to maintain that associating proteins in complexes would help us to functionalize proteins, even, even though we cannot do a direct biochemical assay. So the experiment we're doing is a very old experiment, 
but it is now very tractable and actually highly informative through new techniques. So we separate, we isolate native complexes, we extract them under mild conditions, which is basically was the mainstay of all biochemistry in the, in the 60s and much of the 70s and even earlier. We separate these complexes, native complexes, by size exclusion chromatography, which is also the mainstay <coughs> of protein purification, except this is now done with very high quality, high pressure comms, and we collect about 65 fractions, consecutive fractions. And we analyze each fraction by DIA mass spectrometry. This generates um, elution profiles across this native separation for approximately, from a cell line, for approximately 5,000 proteins. And we know, of course, the molecular weight of the monomeric form of this protein. So we can immediately predict whether a protein is monomeric or it's associated with something else. And through a software tools that were um, developed by Isabel Brudau uh, and, and Moritz Heusel, we can, we can do hypothesis testing whether a certain protein complex is present or not. Um, so this was described and is not the subject of this discussion. And now I'd like to go a step further and basically start with about 5,000 um, such elution profiles, and we project them now onto protein interaction networks. We basically test the hypothesis whether um, a specific perturbation changes a specific region of the protein-protein interaction network. And the protein-protein interaction networks we use is quorum, string, or PREPI, these, these are all different types of protein-protein interaction networks that have been generated. It also could be Bioplex. So we represent here a protein interaction networks by having proteins, the symbols, and they have an edge, and this edge indicates the likelihood that in the data set, the sex was data set of a specific cell, this interaction is observed. And this interaction, we call this interaction observed, if the proteins, these two proteins, that the, this half moon and the, and the blue, uh, precisely co-elute in the dimension of, um, of native separation. So there's approximately a dozen factors that tell us whether they are likely to be um, interacting because it's not just the, the, the co-elution of the apex or the peak shape, the relative intensity and so on. So there's a, it's basically the same principle that we apply that you would apply with uh, in in skyline for scoring uh, peak groups of of, uh, of of transitions to to identify or determine that the peptide is present. So there's a number of factors which fact which allow us to calculate the probability that this interaction is observed in this state. So we now have two states, for instance, a state A and a state B, and we would say this interaction here is observed in this state. It is also observed in this state. We have also interaction here which is between the ochre half moon and the, and the violet uh, circle. And in this case, there's evidence that in this state that this interaction is present, is observed, and in this case, it's not observed. So this basically, these peaks are absent, and they don't, or they don't uh, co-elute. So with that, we can walk through, basically, the whole interaction network a string, a string, and test each interaction where there's evidence in the data set that in this particular instance, this interaction is likely to be active or not. So, so this is, uh, this is a, an algorithm that is called CCAT, was developed by George Rosenberger, uh, who is now a postdoc in the Califano group, and that it's been described in bioarchives. So now when we use two of these cell lines, of these HeLa cell lines, um, that are phenotypically different, we can see differences at the level of protein organization, which are fairly profound. And I will show them that they directly lead to functional insights that relate to phenotypes. This is an overview. Each dot is a, is a protein complex, uh, is a pro, and, and, in, and there's, they're color coded. And, we, and in this complex, we see various differences. The color code is down here. We see differences in total abundance, in monomeric abundance of this protein, 
in the assembled abundance of this protein with other proteins. And, and so there's a whole range of different uh, qualitatively different differences we see for proteins that are part of protein complexes. Overall, we can test in this data set about 7,000 protein-protein interactions using this algorithm. And this is a balance sheet of the type of differences we detect by two cell lines, which are nominally HeLa cells, but they have diverged through genetic drift. So we see, for instance, 86 complex stoichiometry differences, uh, 82 differences in protein interactions, um, 80, 80 differences in the complex is of different abundance, and so on. So there's a rich information that is directly functionally relevant because each one of these complexes are on the goals of change very likely has some biochemical connotation, for instance, from APMS experiments or from, from association studies. I think I, I need to skip that for a reason of time. Yeah, we have just one or two minutes left. Yes, but I wanted to, to show now that specific changes in complexes can explain the phenotype of invasiveness of um, salmonella because we, we can basically reconstruct from this data a whole organelle, uh, which is called the invadopodium, which is a complex mechanism of where the salmonella are invading the cell. And if there's a disbalance of subunits, which is of, of, in a complex, which is observable from this data, this, uh, this, this uh, organelle is not forming and, and, and the salmonella cannot invade. So basically to make a link through the genomic variation the, uh, to the uh, expression of genomic variation at the level of transcripts and proteins, but now also at the level, level of protein interaction networks. And because protein in, proteins tend to interact around specific functions, we can then relate some of these perturbed functions to specific biochemical um, pathways, for instance, since this invade of podium, which explains a numerically measurable phenotype. So I was, um, I was planning to, but now run out of time, to show, also make the point that we can detect differences in individual proteins, for instance, through alternative splicing or PTMs, and then test whether these modifications would affect the organization of the proteome. So specifically what we're trying to test here is whether if a gene con generates alternatively spliced protein or through alternative splicing different proteins, whether these different proteins associate with different complexes. That would indicate immediately that the two or more splice, splice proteoforms that are being generated undergo or participate in different functions. And this um, is the principle of that is that if we have a protein showing here the exons that can be alter alternatively spliced into a blue protein where this exon is being used and this one where this exon is being used, we can use in the native separations of these protein profiles through sec fractionation we can ask whether the, the reddish and the blue in exons basically uh, form proteins that associate with the same or with different protein complexes. And so Isabel Bludau has generated an algorithm that tests that for the whole, uh, for the whole data set. And so she can detect from in, in one particular instance where we look for cell cycle dependent changes in, pro in proteoforms associating with different complexes from about 5,000, 4,800 proteins, she detects 413 instances where, it, where in a gene generates different proteoforms and these proteoforms associate with different protein complexes indicating different functionality of these splice isoforms that are being generated part of some of which are cell cycle specific. So I, I don't have time to show this data, but I would now like to summarize what I try to show and try to discuss. 
So initially I showed that proteomics has made enormous progress in the, in, from the point of view of identifying proteins from virtually all protein coding genes. I then try to say that we are facing two very significant uh, challenges still in proteomics. Even though we can measure these proteins very well, we would need to understand and eventually factor in that this, the protein coding capacity of the genome is vastly expanded across the axis of gene expression through a variety of mechanisms, including splicing, including PTMs, including so, to some extent combinatorial association of proteins into models. And that it, it is this complexity that determines eventually the phenotype. I then also try to show the other, that the other um, fundamental challenge you're facing is that even though we can measure a lot of things along this axis, we don't necessarily know what, what these molecules or modules are doing biochemically. And I try to focus on a variety, on, on several levels. For instance, that we would be able to use um, correlative analysis to functionalize PTMs. I try to show that there's enormous biochemical functional information at the level of the protein organization. And at the last part I wanted to show, which I had to basically skip over, that we can combine um, the association of proteoforms, differential association of proteoforms with different complexes as a readout uh, to say whether specific splice forms or PTMs participate in different functions by associating with different uh, functional complexes. So with that, I would like to finish and acknowledge some my collaborators who's, and group members whose work I discussed here. Uh, everything that we do uh, and presented is based on data sets which are mostly generated by this SWOST DIA measure, me method, which was um, developed by Ludovic Schier and Pedro, Nav Pedro Navarro. And Hans Rust and George generated software tools. I mentioned the collaboration with Matthias Mann's group and, and Brucker um, uh, on this DIA passive instrument. Hannes Röst is also involved in that by extending the uh, open SWOTH software to the extra dimension of iron mobility that is provided by this DIA passive. Um, I mentioned the, or discussed a, the functionalization of phospho proteoforms, the work of Tina Ludwig, Anna Paula Oliveira, and Paula Picotti. I mentioned complex protein protein interaction network differential analysis, the work from Isabel Bludau. Uh, Moritz Heusel, George Rosenberg, and Yan Sheng Lu, and the association of proteoforms with complexes, the work of Isabel Bludau, Max Frank, Charlotte Mann, Hannes Röst from Toronto. You see that virtually everyone on her list here has now a different association, a name, a different um, uh, organizational affiliation, and that is because our lab basically dissolved, and all these um, fantastic scientists who made these contributions are now continuing their career. In, uh, in different uh, institutions, which makes me, of course, very happy. Thanks for um, listening, and I'm happy to answer some questions. Thank you so very much, Rudy. So on behalf of everybody, have a big virtual round of applause uh, for you. So we do have a bunch of questions, which I left to the end, because some of them are fairly general. So we have a series of questions, and we will take a few, so we won't go for too long. So a few technical questions about the network. Do you get the same networks if you use S200 and S300 chromatographic sec columns? Um, we, for as far as the proteins complexes are that are separated by these different columns, the answer should be the same, but they have different ranges of, um, of separation power. And, and then of course there is a number of complexes that you don't see in one column, but may see in the other, and may be resolved. So the S usually refers to Cephodex, and we don't use Cephodex. This Cephodex, of course, is, a, is, a, is extremely well established, but these are ten, tend to be relatively large columns, and these are low-pressure columns. We use uh, high-pressure columns uh, to do basic HP, HPLC-type separation uh, by sizing and of this, there's a whole panel 
of columns available. Some some separate up to uh, 10 mega megadaltons or even very large modules like mitochondria are still separable. And in fact, we actually actually do see uh, not mitochondria ribosomes, but in fact we do see um, flavors of very large particles like ribosomes, which is a very interesting direction of research, which is heavy, very heavily pursued. That that uh, modules are extremely well studied biochemically, like the proteasome, uh, the ribosome, and and others. Cop signalosome. They are not inert um, modules. They actually appear in different flavors, and there's a lot of biology to be discovered there. And I think these these native separations are a good tool to do that. So another question is, how do you assign proteins to complexes? Are there any quantitative value cutoffs that you use? Uh, yes. So we assign. So so the. It's of course probably well known that the idea of separating these proteins by native complexes and then mass packing through each fraction is of course not new. There is a, there's a lot of work that's been done by, by many groups, particularly Leonard Foster, uh, Angus Lamont, and, and, and others. Usually the problem was not the measurement, but the uh, but the, exactly the problem that, the, that the, uh, the question raises. You have roughly uh, 5,000 protein elution profiles along the size exclusion axis. The size exclusion chromatography is not a high result, highly resolving technique. It has a peak capacity of certainly below 100. So peak capacity is basically an indication of the number of bins that you could create to, to really distinguish different, uh, to distinguish different mole molecular entities uh, from each other. So it is essentially a, pro a problem that you have by chance a relatively high likelihood that out of these 5,000 proteins, two might co, co elute with in the same peak, uh, but not actually interact. So this has been a, a, a difficult issue for a long time. And so the, we, we proposed that we basically would make a transition like we made from discovery proteomics to targeting proteomics, which is basically a transition from discovering things to doing multiple hypothesis testing. And we would do this also at the level of protein complexes. So we call this complex centric analysis and we use prior information from the, for instance, from a database for a quorum or, a, or string and say, and then we test the hypothesis whether a interaction that is known to occur is present in the data set that we have, we have generated. So this narrows down the space uh, a lot and basically converts the problem into a multiple hypothesis testing problem for which there's formalisms to also uh, calculate probability values that this observation is correct. Whereas if you're in the discovery mode, it's much, much harder to do. So we think that this transition to a hypothesis testing mechanism has been very beneficial for the analysis of protein complexes and protein interaction networks, as I tried to show, because we can assign to each interaction a probability which we, which we believe and have evidence uh, through to testing that they're, they're reasonably accurate. And so the false positives are basically uh, are controlled or are, are going away. The downside of this approach is, of course, that you do not discover new interactions which have never been observed. And so uh, we think that the benefit of having probability values associated outweighs the danger or the threat that you lose or miss some novel, some interaction which have not previously been discovered. Okay, one more question. There have been several reports indicating the importance of peptides or small proteins, such as those codified by small ORFs. They are often not detected in traditional proteomic analysis because they're not in the databases, they're not detected, etc. Using the current technology, how can we deepen uh, in this so-called hidden proteome? 
Uh, yes, there, of course, there's many, there's many groups have worked very diligently to try to identify uh, these small, smaller molecules, smaller proteins. <coughs> um, technically, from the measurement point of view, this is, I think, quite reasonably well under control. I mean, there's ways to select smaller fractions uh, to do size separation, for instance, to fractionate small fractions, and then to sequence uh, these molecules. So also, of course, that's an area where top-down mass spectrometry is particularly powerful because we're dealing with relatively small uh, molecules. And so I think from the measurement point of view, again, this is a reasonably tractable problem. The real issue, again, is what I try to discuss in my whole presentation, is to try to make biological sense out of this. So for instance, uh, there has been a lot of effort for quite a while to measure uh, blood in the blood, blood plasma, small um, molecules, I mean, small peptides. And, the, uh, and uh, for, from the point of view that they might develop into biomarkers, it turns out this is very difficult to do. Um, not Again, of course, also from the measurement side, but, but even more so from the interpretation side, because there's a lot of factors that determine whether such small molecules, small, small proteins are present and why they are present. <coughs> Many of them are thought to be to arise simply from unspecific proteolysis, basically the pro proteolysis products. Others may be designed to be cut out specifically through prote processing to create a new functional entity. There's cases of that known where, where a polyprotein is cleaved into smaller polypeptides. Each one of them has a specific function. But to learn whether, whether they are functional, whether they are simply byproducts of degradation or byproducts of some other process uh, is actually very difficult to do. And I think this is, uh, again, an, an, an example where the measurement has progressed very quickly, the assignment of biological significance uh, has lagged behind because it's a particularly challenging problem. Well, thank you, Rudy, very much. So I think in the interest of time, we need to stop. We have quite a few more questions. So I'm carrying them over to the Google Doc. And Rudy, if you have the chance, if your schedule allows, maybe take a look at those if you can answer but if not, uh, we certainly understand. So let no, us. No, I will close. make a, I make an effort to go through and uh, answer as many as I as I can in next. This is perfect. Uh, this is perfect. Thank you so very much. So if I didn't get the chance to ask your question, it will be posted uh, in the Google Doc. Well, thank you very much again to Rudy, to our speakers, and to all the participants uh, for being with us today. I hope that it was a good use of your time. And so tomorrow and Friday, we have a deep dive into Skyline with presentations led by Brandon McLean. It's ve we are very fortunate to have a chance to follow these presentations by the developer of Skyline. And it will be fairly technical, fairly in-depth, and I think we'll be very fortunate to have a chance to learn from Brandon as well. Thank you so very much for 